In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If you were in church this past Sunday, you likely heard it stated, Happy New Year! Sunday was the first Sunday of Advent, which marks the beginning of the new church year. And Advent isn't just about preparing for Christmas, although in the course of our culture, December, and I would even argue November too, uh, certainly that's what it's all about. But yet in Advent, we go back. We go back to the Old Testament prophecies of the coming of the Messiah, and we try to imagine ourselves waiting in expectation and longing for God to come again and fulfill them. But in Advent, we also look forward. We look forward to the appearing of Christ uh, at the end of the age. The time when, just as we also say regularly in the Nicene Creed, He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. With this in mind, it's quite fitting that today we focus on Psalm 80. Psalm 80 is a psalm of longing maybe better described as a psalm of desperation. You see, the psalm is written in the aftermath and in the disaster of Israel, likely the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. In the second half of verse 18, the psalmist writes, Revive us and we will call on your name. With this plea to be revived, you can almost hear the desperation. But revivals don't usually just take place because you ask for one. They usually start with a reawakening of faith in the hearts and lives of Christian people. And that's what Advent is meant to be about too. A reawakening of faith in our hearts and in our lives. If we look at the entire psalm, and we're certainly not going to do that right here, the first thing we notice in green is the refrain that's repeated three times in slightly different form each time. In verse 3, we see, Restore us, O God, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. In verse 7, it adds Almighty, and in verse 9, it adds, or 19, it adds Lord. We're going to come back to this in just a minute, but I want you to carefully look as well at verse 14. Return to us, O God Almighty. The word return here stands for a Hebrew word that is often translated as repent. Normally in the Bible, the word repent is applied to human beings. We're called to turn away from our sin and turn back to God. But occasionally in the Old Testament, it's used for God. God is said to change His mind and repent of His anger towards His people. That's what the people of God are praying for. God, your face is turned away from us. Won't you turn back to us? This ties in with the phrase that is used in the second half of these three verses. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. We might paraphrase this as saying, God, won't you smile on us again? It's been so long since we've seen your smile. I suspect that we all know what this feels like. Sometimes you might go to a close friend and ask them, hey, how you doing? And they reply, well, I've kind of had better days. We can all identify with that in one way or another. There are times when God seems a long way away from us. Individuals go through financial struggles and problems at work, maybe even lose a job and their livelihood. Some experience family, uh, broken family relationships at home, whether it's separation uh, and divorce. We face debilitating illnesses. We lose people we love. We have worries about our kids and our grandkids. We go through family conflict and heartache. Yes, we've seen better days. In Psalm 80, the community reminds God of those better days here in verses 8 through 11. And as you scan these verses, we see Israel was like a grapevine that God brought up out of Egypt and planted in the good land of Canaan. The people filled the country and flourished, and for many years it seemed God truly was really blessing them. But now what's happened? You see here in verses 12 through 13, Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feast or feed on it. 
We can almost imagine the writer of the psalm standing in the ruins of Samaria or Jerusalem, looking around and shaking his head. God, why have you done this? Why have you abandoned us? We are your flock and you are our shepherd. We are your vine and you are the owner of the vineyard. We are your firstborn son. How could this, how could this have happened to us? Other passages in the Old Testament give an explanation for this. They talk about how Israel turned away from God to worship false gods and practice injustice and oppression. But this psalm doesn't go there. It doesn't assign blame, or if it does, it actually throws blame on God. We can hear the anger in the people's voices. God, where are you? How come you didn't help us? Please come now and rescue us from this desperate situation we're in. How long are you going to expect us to wait? So, what is the psalm calling us to today? Us as followers of Jesus. Well, three things. First, the psalm is actually calling us to pray. The psalms are a prayer book of the people of God. We use them as prayers and also as models for prayers. Are you afraid to tell God how you really feel? The Psalms encourage you not to be afraid. Are you wondering if your little troubles are important enough to pray about? The Psalm encourages you and I to pray about everything. And the Psalms speak for us when we can't find the words to speak. So the Psalm is calling us to prayer. Second, the Psalm is calling us to turn. As we've seen in verse 14, the people beg God to turn back to them. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. In other words, turn to us and let see your smile again upon us. But the turning is actually a two-way street. In the refrain, remember, the people ask three times, Restore us, O God Almighty. We could translate that, Make us repent, O God. This might seem strange to us, though. After all, we're familiar with the call to repent. We know we need to turn away from sins and distractions and turn towards God and His will for us. But we usually see it, something, or we usually see it as something that we need to do. But here, it's a prayer that we pray to God. Make us repent, O God. And I would suggest to you that this is an honest and realistic prayer. Change is hard. Whether it's the change of trying to lose weight, the change of trying to not be so bad-tempered, the change of learning patience, the change of maybe being more careful about how we talk to people, those pathways have created habits in our brains, and they're like deep ruts in a gravel road. One, dis one writer actually describes it this way, our human propensity to mess things up. You know, when I first read that phrase, I, I had to give a grunt of recognition. Man, that's me. I have an incredible talent for messing things up, for disappointing people, for wronging relationships, for failing to live according to God's commands. And I find it incredibly difficult to change. So any hope that's based on my ability to do things differently isn't going to get me very far because that ability is severely hampered by my own human weakness. So the psalm acknowledges that we can't do this alone. We need God's help. Restore us, O Lord, God Almighty. This isn't a cop-out. It's not asking God to do something we should do for ourselves. It's simply a humble acknowledgement that if we want to change our lives, our human strength isn't up to that job. We need to come to God in desperation and of faith and cry out for God's help. So the psalm encourages us to pray. It also encourages us to turn to God. Finally, the psalm also encourages us to have hope in Jesus. Now, I have to admit, we have to look a little bit more carefully to see this in Psalm 80, but once we do, it's actually all over the psalm. It's actually quite striking how Jesus takes up metaphors in this psalm and uses them for himself and for his work. 
in verse 1, he says, Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you lead Joseph like a flock. Shepherd in the Old Testament is a metaphor for king. But who is the good shepherd in the New Testament? It's Jesus, of course. In John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He actually talks about calling his sheep by name and leading them out, guiding them and feeding them. In Psalm 23, David prays, The Lord is my shepherd. In the New Testament, the Lord is Jesus, the good shepherd. Jesus has been called the human face of God. So when people pray, make your face shine on us, O God, Jesus is answering that prayer. And what about the vine metaphor? The psalm talks about Israel and God's, or about Israel as God's vine, planted in the land to produce good fruit. But who is the true vine in the New Testament? Well, again, it's Jesus. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. That's in John chapter 15. In the Old Testament, the prophets talk about God looking for good fruit on his vine, but only finding bitter grapes. In other words, his people didn't produce the good fruit of holy living that he was looking for. But Jesus is the fruitful vine. And what does he say to us? Abide in me as I abide in you. To abide means to make your home there. So we make Jesus our spiritual home. We live in fellowship with him. We listen to his words and put them into practice. And with his help, and only with his help, can we produce the good fruit that God is looking for. The third metaphor is the Son of Man. Verse 17 says, Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the Son of Man you have raised up for yourself. In the original context, this is a metaphor for Israel. Israel is God's firstborn son. But in the Gospels, Jesus takes it and uses it for himself. It actually becomes his favorite way of talking about himself. In other words, Jesus is the true Israelite. He's the chosen one of God. He's the one who shows us what it means to be God, but also to be truly human. And when we look to Jesus, we're looking at God's dream of what a human life is supposed to be like. In him, as we make our home in him, it's possible for us then to truly repent, to truly love, to truly pray, and truly to be faithful to God. So let's go around this one last time. The psalm calls us to pray, not just as individuals, but also as a community. We pray as desperate people, people who realize that life is often too much for us, that we're not up for the task, and that we need help. But we also pray as people of faith, people who know we've been invited to turn to Jesus and to ask for help. This psalm calls us to turn, or to be more accurate, it calls us to ask God to help us turn. We know that often we get distracted by many things. And sometimes our lives are consumed by stuff that's not going to have anything to do with loving God and loving our neighbor. So we ask God to help us turn from that and then turn back to God. And lastly, it's a time to look to Jesus. He's the human face of God. In him, God has shown the light of his countenance upon us. He's made his face shine upon us. Starting to sound familiar? We've seen the smile of God in him. He's our good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, he says, so we take care to hear his voice. And where he leads, there we will follow. This is not a wish or even a prayer but a certain promise from God that we can cling to in all and any times of trouble. And how appropriate is it, friends, that we get to hear this promise at the end of every single daily chapel service we have together. So let's do that right now. Let's close our service today by receiving this promise with believing hearts. May the Lord bless you and keep you.
May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face upon you and give you his peace. Amen.